So I think we'll get started. Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Jill Evans. I'm the director of the Essex Community Justice Center. Um, and for those of you who don't know what the Community Justice Center is, we uh, are funded by the Department of Corrections, operate through the town of Essex, and provide um, alternative justice responses to crime and conflict in the community, communities that we serve. And we work with people coming out of prison to reconnect them in sort of radical ways that people who are re-entering their communities from prison wouldn't normally get to experience. And we also hold community forums about um, engaging community and talking about issues that are important to the community. And obviously, the idea that a women's prison is being proposed to be built here is one that while the CJC is neutral in terms of whether or not that's a good idea, we agree with it or disagree with it or anything, we see it as our role to convene um, community members to come together and to have dialogue about stuff like that. I also live in this community, so I have just as many questions as many of you do about what would this mean if there was a women's prison built in our community and how would it impact us? Um, <clears throat> this is the first of what I think will be many forums happening. This is not uh, a quick process. We're talking years and years and years if it is to um, come to fruition. So um, we wanted to get out front and start trying to provide opportunities for the community to be more informed and involved. And we'll, we are committed to continuing to do that. So there's actually a sign up sheet that if you want to put your email down, we'll, we can keep you informed as more forums get scheduled. Um, <clears throat> This is a very separate process than what's happening through the um, town of Essex and through its government bodies. So the planning commission is where things are happening and there's public comment being taken and conversations and decisions will be made about siting and zoning and all that kind of stuff. This is not, has nothing to do with that. This is just creating a container for us to come together as a community to talk about this is a proposed thing to happen and what is it gonna look like. Um, we're sitting in a circle because that's the way that the Community Justice Center does our work. We believe we're part of the community and that, and especially in something like this, we feel very strongly that people who are criminal justice involved and are sent away to prison or that kind of thing don't, are not, are not like banished from our communities. 98% of them come back and so we want to help them be successful. So um, sitting with you in a circle instead of like talking at you or Presenting from a podium is not the way that we uh, do business. So, um, let's see. We are probably not going to be able to answer all the questions that people have, but we're committed to following up and either providing more opportunities for questions to be asked or getting responses and sending them out. So, that's another reason why you might want to put your email on one of those pads of paper. And then there's another pad of paper that if you had a specific question that you wanted address that we didn't get to today, then feel free to put that on there. Um, so this isn't a forum where we're going to take public comment. It's very informal. It's not a forum where um, we're going to be talking about whether or not we should be building a new prison. We wanted to provide an opportunity for you to hear from community-based providers who've been working in the women's prisons for over 20 years at this point. They've been at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility for about, I think, 14, 12 or 14 years at this point. Um, but these are members of our community and programs in our communities who've been working with this population for a long time. So we wanted to really give the opportunity to hear what their experiences have been. Um, and so we're going to have each of the programs present to each of you. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. So we'd ask that you hold your questions for each program as they go um, until the end. And I guess the only other thing that I would want to say is that they are contracted by and funded by the Department of Corrections. There are some folks in this circle who work not only for the Department of Corrections, but also for buildings and grounds. And they're available here. Um, they're mostly in that little area right here. <laughs> Even though I told them to disperse and not to go um, so they're here and available to answer questions that might arise that are more appropriate for their um, thing. But um, 
they can attest to this, there's nothing about being funded by the Department of Corrections that means that you're censored or that you can't speak freely. And so I want people to know that the providers that are here to speak are here to speak candidly and openly about their experiences and that that is supported through the partnership that they've had with the Department of Corrections for the past 20 years. So um, I'm gonna have each of the people who are gonna be doing the presentation to briefly introduce themselves and you can also point out in the audience if there are other people that are connected to your program who aren't gonna actively be presenting, but just so people know who's in the audience. And Kyla, we'll start with you. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Kylan Mayu. Um, I'm the director of the DIVAS program at CRCF. DIVAS stands for Discussing Intimate Violence and Accessing Support. It's a project of the Vermont Network. I'm joined today by Karen and Charlie who are also with the Vermont Network. Um, DIVAS has been in the women's correctional facility in Chittenden since they moved there. Um, before that, it was a program that was contracted. So when the women were at Northwest, they contracted with Voices Against Violence. When they were in Windsor, they contracted with the Women's Freedom Center. So they've moved around. As the women have moved around, the services have moved with them. But since they've been at CRCF, um, there's been an in-house uh, domestic and sexual violence advocacy program um, working with the women there. Uh, nationally, over 80% of people that are incarcerated have an experience of domestic or sexual violence at some point in their life. Yeah. Are you presenting? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't know you. This is very informal. Okay. You just introduced. Hi. So people know who you are. Very thorough introduction, Kyle. I was ready. All right. All right. I'm ready. 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 I'm ready
Um, what we know is that about nationally, over 80% of people, women specifically that are incarcerated um, have an instance of domestic or sexual violence. Um, in the Jinmen Regional Correctional Facility, we know that's somewhere over 90%. Um, we work with almost all the women who come through the facility at some point. Um, our program offers a lot of different kinds of services. So um, when people first come in, and you'll hear this from other providers as well, we do an orientation um, to our to the facility and to our programs and what we can offer. Um, most concretely, my program offers a lot of education and advocacy while folks are incarcerated. Um, that looks like one-on-one -on -one support, so people can uh, voluntarily you know, self-refer into our program. They meet with us, we talk about um, kind of whatever it is that's coming up for them. If that's something really specific that was happening um, that was DV or SV related before they came into the facility, if it's a long history of trauma, if it's the experience of being incarcerated, which is often really traumatizing for folks. Um, we offer all kinds of different, uh, you know, emotional support, resources, mindfulness activities, um, and most importantly, we offer a confidential space. So my program has something called victim crisis worker privilege. So everything that we talk about in the diva space um, stays in our office, which is often um, why people come down to check in initially. Um, and because we have notebooks and folders and pens, which are a hot commodity. <laughs> um, so people will, you know, and we develop relationships with people um, that are really deep and really profound. And we become a really, I think, trusted resource for a lot of women in the facility. Um, we also do a lot of educational groups. So a lot of times people meet with us one-on-one -on -one to start out, um, and then we explain, you know, we've got dropping groups where everyone can come down if they want to. We do longer-term curriculum-based groups around healthy relationships, unhealthy relationships, um, you know, mindfulness healing. We do art groups, yoga groups. We've had presenters come in. We do a lot of writing as well. Um, so we try to keep things really like updated and new so that people can keep coming back and engaging and learning new things with us. Um, something that we notice a lot is that a lot of folks who come in don't understand that what they've been experiencing for a long time was an unhealthy relationship or was domestic violence. Um, and for a lot of people who do know that, a lot of times incarceration can be a turning point for that, that they're not going to return back to a relationship like that afterwards or want to make a change or um, learn new coping skills and things like that. So as folks are getting ready to leave as well, we get them prepared if it's a safety plan, if it's connecting them with one of the uh, one of the 15 member organizations across the state, we can get them into domestic violence shelters, um, making sure that they have like those basic needs and support set up so when they return to the community they don't have to return to a violent relationship as well. Um, we work really closely with Jess and Heather and Kelly and we like I'm in contact with these three women almost daily um, and we work as a team to try and make sure that everyone has all of their needs met before they go um, and we also just provide a lot of ongoing support for people while they're incarcerated. We also have a um, memorandum of understanding with the department that anything um, sexual misconduct related that happens, if it's between two incarcerated individuals or a staff member and an incarcerated individual, um, DIVAS is the uh, advocacy organization that's called to support the person through any interviewing process or um, providing them additional support afterwards. Um, we also help people obtain relief from abuse orders, we do divorces, all kinds of different sort of things to make sure that people have a really um, robust system of support for when they're um, heading out afterwards. And then once people do transition out of the facility, I'm available in the community to them to help them with those referrals to community organizations, ongoing confidential emotional support, and um, making sure that they can stay connected to Kelly or to Heather, which is the community case manager through Kids Apart, getting connected to a CJC. Um, we last year worked with, I think, 180 individuals um, and had almost 1,500 individual meetings with those 180 uh, individuals. So it's myself and two other part-time advocates right now. Um, we have an office that's in the correctional facility. Um, and then we spend a lot of time working on larger projects with the network as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to partner with Kids Apart really closely the last couple of years through the Healing Together project, where we've worked with um, non-offending uh, 
parents and families who have experienced domestic violence and their children. Um, we were able to bring in a project to the facility called the Lullaby Project, which is a national project, but in Vermont, it's partnered with Scrag Mountain Music and Writers for Recovery. And those folks came into the correctional facility and we had, we've now had three groups of moms come in and they um, do these really beautiful healing writing exercises and pull phrases and words from those. And Scrag Mountain Music helps them compose and create a lullaby an individual personalized lullaby, each of them, that they get to send home to their kids afterwards. Um, and one of ours from CRCF was actually um, selected and played at Carnegie Hall a couple years ago for their national concert. So it's really, really exciting to be able to bring so many unique and special opportunities to this population. Um, I've been working there for seven years, and I really, um, feel very honored to be able to go in there every day and you know this is a people's temporary house and for them to allow us to come in and to trust us and build relationships with them is something that's really unique and something that I uh, have a trouble putting words to it's really really special um, I think that's it for now that's great yeah thank you so we will move on to kids part and yes good morning so Kids Apart has been providing services inside the women's facilities in Vermont since 2003 and has been a Lund program since 2011. I have been with the program uh, as of this week, October 1st is my uh, anniversary date of this, in this work, 17 years. I've been working uh, full time inside the women's correctional facility and like Kylan said, it's work that I am truly honored um, to be able to do uh, what we know what we know nationally is that 75 to 80 percent of incarcerated women are moms we work any woman who is incarcerated at uh, Chittenden that has is pregnant or has a child up until the age of 18 has the ability to access services through our program we primarily, my primary role um, is to provide case management for those moms. The goal of our program is to reduce the trauma that a child experiences when their parent is incarcerated. And so I'm there to keep those moms connected to whomever is connected to their children. Uh, that can be their child's caregiver, it could be DCF, it could be family court, it could be staff, at their, the child's school, uh, healthcare providers, uh, mental health clinicians, whoever it's important for that mom to be connected to. There are women that enter the facility that have that are their uh, children's primary caregivers, ones who uh, have shared custody, who don't have custody of their children, but are very close to the person who has guardianship. They may even live in the same house with their children, but not have primary uh, custody. Others who say, well, I go, I go to the house every day after school, I'm there till bedtime, and then I go back to my place. There's women who have visitation and see their children maybe once a week, or only through video. Uh, and there are women who don't have contact with their children. Uh, there may have been a falling apart of the relationship with the caregivers. There may have been a termination of parental rights or the mom may have placed the child uh, in an adoption. Um, and whatever those circumstances are, we're there to support that mom uh, in whatever, whatever way is meaningful for her, whatever her goal is. Um, working, you know, we're fortunate that not, we do have women enter the facility that are pregnant. People often have questions about preg incarcerated pregnant women. Fortunately, it's very rare that a woman is actually incarcerated while she, when she delivers. Most women, um, the facility works very hard to get those women uh, moved out of the facility and into the community um, with uh, residential treatment at Lund being one of the options that's provided. But about once a year or less, we do have a woman that delivers and we have a birth plan that we've written um, to take everything in consideration from the moment she goes into labor until she returns to the facility. I am the one person who um, is allowed to go to the hospital um, to spend time with that mom and her baby. 
Uh, make sure to take photos. Um, if if there's a need, um, if, the depart if the Department of Children and Families in is involved uh, and visits need to be supervised, I'm there to make sure that that happens and really support um, that mom. Uh, we also encourage, um, we don't, well, let me rephrase that. We support women who choose to breastfeed. We support the moms in whatever way they choose to um, to feed their babies. And women who do choose breastfeeding, there's a breast pump. I get so many questions about this. <laughs> there is absolutely a breast pump in the facility that women can access. They go down and they're able to pump about four times a day. And we have a dedicated freezer that they can store milk in. And when the child visits, when the infant visits, we um, have the caregiver bring a cooler, and then we can send milk home each week with that baby. Um, I also work very closely with the correctional staff within the facility, with the superintendent, um, the assistant superintendent, the caseworkers. Um, and I, we really try to um, I describe the Kids Apart program as a parent-child center. In Vermont, we have parent-child centers in all of our counties, a network of parent-child centers. Uh, and Lund is a parent-child center. And I describe Kids Apart as being a miniature parent-child center within the facility. We provide the services that are there to support the family. Um, and so we work really hard to have this program be a Lund program within the facility. So I, you know, I will show up in the superintendent's office and say, I have this idea. There's this thing I want to do. Um, and very often, most of the time, they're very open to working with these ideas. One of the things I do love about our jobs is that um, we have a lot of ability to be very creative in how we approach this work. And the Department of Corrections is actually very um, responsive to the things we suggest. Um, so that those relationships that we have with the staff inside the facility make it possible for us to do things like the Lullaby Project and the great work um, that the other programs do. Um, we offer visitation through a program twice a month. We have mother-child visits with a group of moms on a Saturday morning. There's actually one going on at the facility this morning with uh, there are four moms and four children uh, who have just, will be starting a visit. I think that clock is wrong. So they started a visit at 10 o'clock. So they're visiting right now and they're um, snacking on pizza, veggies, and ranch dressing, which the facility provides to us because if you're gonna feed a group of children, that is basically the food that you want to eat. <laughs> we also do one-on-one -on -one visits because sometimes a group visit isn't appropriate. Um, sometimes a child and a parent need to have a conversation that they deserve a quiet place to have without other people around. Some, you know, and that could be a mom explaining to a child how long her sentence is going to be. Or sometimes it's, hey, you know, I hear that you and grandma are really butting heads lately. Can we talk about what's going on? Because it sounds like you maybe need to talk about some of that. We also do one-on-one -on -one visits for the infants because I think they need a quieter space to visit with their moms. Mm -hmm. And Saturdays are a little uh, not quiet. Um, in two weeks, we'll have a visit where the children will arrive in their Halloween costumes because it's really important for them to be able to show their moms what they're wearing for Halloween. And I will have purchased a very large amount of candy. <laughs> <laughs> Our services are trauma-informed. Um, we recognize that the women we work with have had very complex experiences. Many of them, many of them were in um, DCF custody as children. It's not uncommon for a woman to come into our office and let us know that she um, herself went into foster care at seven years old and was in as many as um, 24 placements until she turned 18. And so, um, you know, one of the ways of working with the women is to really, is that we really hold space for their lived experiences and 
and are there to, again, to support them in their goals um, in moving forward. Yes, awesome, Jess. Um, I want to note that I forgot to have you and Mary Beth um, have a moment to speak, so we'll do that after the presentation. Um, could you just talk about one more thing that I think is really important for people to hear, and that's about the ability to have physical contact with kids of art. Yeah, absolutely. So in a, can you raise your hand if you have been inside a correctional facility? Okay. Um, can you raise your hand if you've been in a visiting room in the correctional facility for any reason? Uh, there are tables in the visiting rooms in each of the facilities in Vermont uh, during a regular facility visit. <laughs> The incarcerated individual, which is the term that the terminology that we're currently using, right? They sit on one side of the table, their visitors sit on the other. If their child is under the age of 12, they can sit on the same side as their moms. If they are over the age of 12, they sit on the opposite side of the table with a plexiglass <laughs> divider between them. So I would like you to picture. Um, visiting with a child that's important to you um, with your nine-year-old sitting next to you and your 14-year-old on the other side of plexiglass with no ability to touch. For most of us, that's unimaginable. Um, in the visiting room, there are books. Uh, there are a few toys um, that they have access to, but really it's a sit at the table um, and stay at the table with minimal physical contact setting. And that's just the reality of what it is. The kids apart space is a playroom. My office is a playroom. <laughs> um, it is overflowing with Legos and art supplies and stuffed animals who all have names. There's you know, like Flora the elephant and Clementine the giraffe. Um, who keep me company when nobody else is in the office. <laughs> and, um, any mom who has a visit in there, whether she is visiting with an infant or an 18-year-old, she is able to sit next to her child and have physical contact throughout the visit. Um, and one thing I always want folks to know is that um, we know that those infants need that physical touch. We know that those toddlers need physical touch. What I want everyone to know is that those 17-year-olds also need physical touch and that um, usually the teenagers that visit their moms, they're usually sitting on the couch together with their legs crisscrossed and leaning into each other, arms around each other, and that physical contact, contact lasts for the entire visit. Um, and that's, that's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. And it um, is one of the things that we are very um, grateful to be able to provide those families. Uh, okay. um, so I'm Heather Newcomb, and I am the program manager for Justice Involved Services at Vermont Arts for Women. We lead activities in the Career Resource and Reentry Center, which used to be known as the Multi-Purpose Room because it was used for lots of different activities. But now we've redesigned it; it's the Career Resource Center. So we do career exploration activities. We do weekly classes on personal and professional development. And we also run the in-facility worker program. So Windows to Work is the program I'd like to start with. And that is the worker program in the facility. I like to say we act as the HR department for this program because Many of the women hold facility jobs, whether it's cleaning the hallways, working in the kitchen, doing laundry. Um, we have a facility navigator who meets with every new intake, make sure that they received all supplies that they need, they know who their caseworker is, and how to access commissary and get phone numbers on their pin sheet from the incarcerated individual's perspective. Um, oftentimes when we do that orientation that Kylan mentioned, many of the women are going through detox or they're in shock from their experience of being incarcerated. So a lot of that information doesn't really sink in. And so the facility navigator is an incarcerated individual that helps, 
you know, new folks orientate to the facility from the incarcerated individual perspective. And windows to work, I like to say, if you're, if you have things to work on to achieve workplace success, I want those behaviors addressed here so that when you're able to leave, you're able to thrive in the workplace. So um, we address issues such as performance issues, um, also proper workplace communication and conflict resolution, teamwork, those sorts of things. We help foster those skills in a coaching framework. Um, we also do a weekly class called Build Your Skills, which is um, personal and professional development, more of those soft skills of employment. Um, so we will talk anything about, like my favorite class is transferable skills. So skills that you learn in one setting, but you can apply them in the new setting. Um, I often, you know, use myself as an example. Um, I approach this work from the lived experience. So what did I need most when I sat in that seat? Um, many of the women have gained skills either through recovery that serve them well in the workplace, and I show them how they can just kind of twist that approach, apply it in a new setting, and then get successful results from that. Um, we work a lot on conflict resolution, assertive communication, um, how to go after a promotion once you do get your foot in the door. Uh, those are all in Build Your Skills classes. Once a month, we do a monthly enrichment night where we have a guest presenter from the community come and oftentimes it's an employer who might be um, you know, second chance friendly or recovery friendly workplace. And they would talk about opportunities for employment within their business. Sometimes it is um, a woman who's in a non-traditional career and she comes to speak about her own pathway into employment, obstacles she faced and overcame. So that women who are considering going into that sector really understand firsthand what another woman's experience was like there. Um, also, we bring in uh, guest presenters from other organizations because a good way to get your foot in the door is through volunteer work. Uh, that's how I was able to re-enter the workforce, uh, was first with a volunteer position, and then when a position became available because I already had relationships, they knew my work ethic as a volunteer. So my application just naturally rose to the top once a position became available. So we let them know different opportunities. Um, we work closely with women because we often say at Vermont Works for Women, it's not about any job, it's about the right job. And so, um, as you can see, many of the women are talented artists and that can be viable income stream once they get out. And so we might talk about, you know, entrepreneurship and those sorts of skills, marketing skills, things they're going to need if that's the way they want to go. Um, it's really about finding what their passion is and finding what their goals are and how can we align a viable employment pathway with those passions and desires. Um, and then I think that's it for programs. I know Ronnie was going to speak a little bit about our history. Well, and I was just going to quickly share, I mean, Heather's been doing this work with Vermont Works for Women for over 10 years. Heather is in the facility full time with another full time Vermont Works for Women staff member. And as an organization, we really recognize employment is just one piece of building success upon re-entering your community. We are really grateful for the partners in the facility because it does take that holistic approach. Really building women up with confidence and empowerment in the facility. Seeing themselves as viable employees in our communities is really important for the work Heather does. Making sure that if there are issues within the facility that we address that in a really supportive manner so that way when women do come out of, out of incarceration and into the community, into workplaces, they have those skills within them to really navigate what that looks like, as well as the support of the organization. 
We also work with a lot of employers, including having conversations across the state to build inclusive hiring employment opportunities so that employers understand what does that lived experience look like? How can it show up at work? How can you address these challenges to have retention of women in the workplace? The women that are experiencing incarceration are really untapped potential in our labor market. These are women who often have high school diplomas or GEDs that have skills that can really be built upon to really meet a lot of the demand that's out there and be highly successful. And so we're really grateful to have the space and the facility to do that work. Also, it goes without saying, Heather is just phenomenal at mm -hmm. being a coach in the facility with women and really showing them what's possible and capable um, even when you have to live behind bars to really think about what that can look like beyond that. And a big thank you to Jill for providing this opportunity to talk about our programs within the facility. Um, mm -hmm. Often we don't get to share them widely, and so we're really grateful to share the incredible programs that happen within the facility, but that also follow the women as they leave as well. Um, that just reminded me, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, those ideas that Jessica mentioned and partnering with DFC. Um, so since many of the women are artists, last year uh, an art exhibit, Finding Hope Within, started at the Rugby Museum and has a lot of artwork contributed by incarcerated women and it is traveling throughout the state. Um, right now it's in Heartland and in November it will be in Williston. Um, and that was a partnership through Department of Corrections. So, you know, I brought this idea to them and they really supported it and did what they needed to do on their end to make it possible. And it just keeps on living because now a book is gonna be uh, written about the art exhibit and the experience. Um, I was able to do a culinary pilot in the facility with support of Department of Corrections. And a lot of um, the ideas that we come with in partnering with community agencies um, for further vocational training. Um, unfortunately, the current facility doesn't really afford in-house training. and We just don't have the space, but because it's centrally located and as it would be in Essex as well, it affords us quick transportation to community training programs, whether it be a semiconductor training program that is in the works um, with Vermont Works for Women and Global Foundries, or Orbital Factory has a textile training program. Um, the Food Shelf runs Community Kitchen Academy. So there are a lot of local resources that we would be able to tap into. Oh, uh, I'm going to defer to Joe to start. Oh, okay. Soft restrictions. That's our that's our relationship in a nutshell. Most days, I was Ronnie read my mind because I was thinking about what a gift it is to really be able to sit and kind of listen to how this all works together. Because generally, we're mired in it every day, and then really tired at the end of the day. I'm sure all of you are. Mercy Connections, I thought I'd start with saying what we are and what we hope to be, um, because I find on the road that some people really have never heard of us, and that's, that's okay. We're an educational nonprofit, and we have a center where we um, put together a lot of classroom space right in the south end of Burlington that's about to be sort of rerouted for um, an entrance into Burlington, so who knows what's going to happen there. But We've been there for quite a few years. We've worked with all of our colleagues here for 20 plus years. And we consider ourselves first a place um, that social, social justice activated and that people come in to sort of, um, you know, just as they are to um, become something that they want to do based on their plans. And in fact, we have all kinds of programs that lots of people um, might be interested to know. We have English language learning. We have inclusive entrepreneurship. Last year we trained 23 uh, new businesses to open up in the state of Vermont. So we're contributing to the gross domestic product here that way. 
Um, we'll, we do justice mentoring and reentry, and Kelly and I um, work really closely together on that. And Kelly's going to jump in and talk a little bit about how we center that in the in the prison for women. We do tutoring. We do U.S. citizenship preparation. So we're every day um, in touch with people from last year, twenty about twenty five international countries. And it's funny because um, you know you think it's a big deal to speak maybe one or two languages. Generally, people walk in our doors for those um, classes and they speak four or five, and they're just trying to brush up on English. Um, we do um, community meal programs, and anybody who's been to our community lunch, which is fabulously well known in the Burlington area for participants, knows that what we try to do is provide a community that first, in an environment that first meets um, basic human needs like hunger and um, practicing pro social activities that offer you an opportunity to be seeing with someone on your right from the director of Spectrum Youth and Family Services, on the left someone from Senator Bernie Sanders' office, and then someone right here who's just gotten out of prison that day. And everybody wears one name tag, which Kelly has beautifully brought today, um, with your name, and that's how you're known, because we believe that people are um, way, way more than the sum of every mistake they've ever made. And that's, that's sort of a place of jumping off. Um, we really, we, feel, we find we're successful when, we, when adults reach, reach their goals in an inclusive, compassionate community, because we know that you make decisions from the inner place out. We're not there to push you into anything. We're there to listen and maybe help you and, and offer you some resources for achieving your own go goals. We know that we're successful when people involved in the justice system successfully re-enter the community. And we also feel very strongly that we're successful if Vermonters gain knowledge and connections that lead to happier lives and uh, more fulfilling lives. And so when I'm going to move over into what we specifically do and how we bring our, our um, uh, mission to the correctional facility, um, We've been in contract um, with the Department of Corrections more than 20 years, and my colleagues on the left are respected colleagues of ours every day, and they are often able to listen to everything that we have to say. Kelly and I meet with um, Kathy Asimborski, the, the program director for Women's Services in Vermont, monthly, and um, like Jill said in the beginning, uncensored. We're able to really work closely with her because it's amazing if you've all read the headlines about how much has changed in the world of incarceration for women um, it didn't get better during COVID and the poor got poorer so that's a piece that we're dealing with still you might think COVID's over but it isn't over we're inside the prisons and it's beginning to get somewhat better and I believe that's why we're all here today to begin to build more um, connections to the community for betterment of that. Um, we have the, um, specifically we bring two of our main programs from our center to the CRCF, the uh, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility in South Burlington. Um, one is the Vermont Women's Mentoring Program, which is inclusive of anyone who identifies as a woman. And we also um, bring what's called personal growth education curriculum. And uh, we're contracted to do both. If we could do all those programs that I just listed inside, we would. And so I'll just keep working with Kathy on that. Um, we did have two women who were Spanish speakers in our personal growth education class um, a couple of months ago. And you know we can't use a phone inside the prison or we'd be you know using Google Translate, which I use every single day. Um, I, I don't even know how to spell some of the African languages that I'm trying to translate some days. And I feel like one of the things that we need to do is learn ways to communicate with people who um, come to our classes from every background. Um, there are some women who are held inside who are federal prisoners. And so what happens with them is they're going to go outside pretty quickly. But those are the folks that we run into speak um, international languages. So just um, 
I think every, it goes without saying that a woman's pathway to prison is paved with trauma, 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 and then more trauma, right? I think all of my compatriots here have said that. And, um, Natalie Braun, one of our mentors, long-standing mentors in the Vermont Women's Mentoring Program, could speak to that as well. Um, and also the research shows that women are relational, right? So what the mentoring program aspires to do is activate a social relationship community for women who may have, and excuse the expression, burned all their bridges. And so they're looking for a relationship that's safe and can be trusted and has boundaries to sort of model how to build relationships. Maybe, maybe they remembered that from younger, maybe they forgot it, maybe they never learned it. But our mentors are women from the community who go through a pretty rigorous training um, at Mercy Connections. We're about to finish our fifth session next week for the fall group. Um, we are meeting monthly for continued education for the mentors. If anyone in here wants to get involved in that, just see me or, or Kelly. And then we also have ways for people to celebrate through um, social events. And so those are kind of the main components of the mentoring program. And what we've done is we've created a relationship between our satellite location at the Correctional Facility and Mercy Connection so that you can meet us first with a compassionate face of Kelly Moran inside. I'm just about to pass it to you, Kel. And um, then when you are released, you are released with your mentor and you're released to our center and you can come there and you can come, you know, continue. There might be some other programs that you want to do, but you're going to find a place that believes in you and that thinks about ways um, to refer you further based on what goals you want to achieve. And so in the, in the prison every day, um, there's a Mercy Connections office. The face of that is Kelly Moran most days. And on Tuesday nights, she and Heather Gilbert, another trained teacher from Mercy Connections, lead the personal growth um, education. I wonder if Kelly, you want to jump in and take yeah, a friend um, So I've been in this position for about 10 years, which is a little bit crazy to think about. Um, but I'm primarily in the correctional facility, and as Kyla and Heather mentioned, the first point of contact is usually at the facility orientation where we get to know the women, but they're not quite in the right space to get all that uh, information. So then they either self-refer or we get referrals from other providers and meet with them one-on-one, -on -one and really to get to know them, get to know them as a person and where they're at in their process of this journey that they're going through. It's not that much fun. Um, so I really try to encourage them to think about what they need as a support. A lot of times they're not even thinking about that, right? Like, what do you need to be, like, to have yourself be successful and get out of this position? So that's where the, our, kind of our mentors come in. Um, and I like them, liken them to a sponsor, a recovery coach, but it doesn't have to do with substances. Um, so it's just another person that is going to encourage you to be there consistently and to listen, which is um, a lot of times what the women don't have or never have had, um, especially getting into the correctional facility, like that journey in, usually their world is pretty small, that bubble is pretty small. Um, so I also try to let them know that, you know, Meeting a new person in that situation can be super scary to trust a new person, but also it opens a door to a world that you don't know. You know, there's things you know, there's things you know you don't know, and then there's things you don't know you don't know. And so <laughs> opening that door is like, ooh, what, what else is out there that I can learn? Um, and usually the women really do want to mentor, but then we've discussed like what, you know, what's stopping them from moving forward. And so, getting a mentor in there, getting to know them, and transitioning it out. Um, as Joe mentioned, we also bring in personal growth programs and classes at night, on Tuesday nights. Um, and usually that's just a fun activity night that's really based on positivity, personal growth, and focusing on how to, uh, pro-social is kind of the word we use, how do we interact pro-socially and nicely. There's a lot of discussion around that. Also, they like the coloring pages <laughs> and coloring books. Um, so yeah, following them in that journey, having the mentors is essential. And then as they transition out, working with the other providers, um, providing a lot of those needs that like you don't really think about, uh, getting hygiene. Some people are coming into the correctional facility literally with no shoes because they're arrested running away. 
Um, so getting them, yeah, just clothes to have on their back and then figuring out those little needs that are, that's going to help them in those first steps out. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, again, working closely with the other providers and making sure that we're supporting this person in a way that they've never been supported before, knowing, like giving them that light that they are a worthy human being and can have a different life. Yeah. So I noted that I um, neglected to have a little part of our presentation happen at the beginning, which I'll go back to, but I just wanted to, so one of the things you've heard, I think, is that there's an opportunity for volunteers to do work with each of these programs. So um, keep that in mind. And another thing, you've heard a lot about trauma, you've heard a lot about, um, actually blanking on what it was, things about women's pro profiles and pathways. And one of the tenets of gender responsive care from way back when is about keeping the women connected to their community, even though they didn't really have a community before they came in. So the women's facility is very unique in that that is part of the design, is that it's not an us and them kind of like the Department of Corrections does their thing and then we're out here in the community. Like the people who do the work in the side of the um, facility are part of our community. And so um, I was gonna have Karen talk a little bit about sort of the broader context of the community in its relation to corrections over the years, and then Mary Beth, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Jill. There's two things that I just want to really point out. First of all, oh my gosh, provider partners, I'm sitting over here trying not to cry when I hear you talk about your work. Oh, I can't even look at you, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, you know, everybody at the network is so grateful for everything they do all day long. Um, and Jill, I just want to recognize the contribution that you've made mm -hmm. over the years during your long tenure mm -hmm. working with women who are living in incarcerated settings and the way that you really brought gender specific um, practices into this work. So thank you so much. I'm neutral though. So. Really long time ago. Pardon me? I'm neutral. <laughs> you are neutral. You are neutral, but you know, you the thing that the theme for me that's emerging is the um, is seeing the humanity of people who are incarcerated and the honor of working with some of Vermont's most vulnerable people. Um, so my job here today is not to do that. Um, my job here today is to talk a little bit about the history. So Kyle mentioned that over the course of the last 20, 20 plus years, the women have been moved pretty regularly around the state. And um, as you can imagine, that those, the, those times of movement create instability and they create challenges for, um, for maintaining services to support the women. I will say that our Department of Corrections has done a really good job of continuing to support the services that have been talked about today. Um, because I think, I'm not going to speak for the Department of Corrections, but I think that they see the value of those services. But back in, um, back in 20, uh, 2011, the Shumland administration decided to move the women from the facility in the Northwest in Swanton, which was a big open, more open facility with lots of outdoor space. I remember visiting there and seeing gardens and um, just lots of natural light. Not, not perfect, but um, you know, better than, than where we're at today. So the Shum administration moved the women to the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. That facility was designed as a detention center. It was never meant for anybody to live there long term. Right away, we were hearing reports, the providers were hearing reports about problems with heat and cooling, with very unfortunate and kind of you know, disgusting situation with drains. Um, the, the facility sits in a low-lying area, the drains back up, there's sewer flies. Um, it was crowded, really crowded. The facility had not been uh, fitted out to be able to support the number of women who were living there. Uh, and there was re really very little space for training, for vocational training, for support, for privacy, for um, even today still, I mean, there's nothing to do outside. You can go out in the yard, but why would you? Um, and there was a real lack of trauma-informed design in that facility because it was never meant to hold anybody for longer than a few days. And, uh, and so over the, well, in 2012, the providers got together. We wrote a, a what we call a white paper the title of that paper was Disturbing Conditions at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. We published that paper, it went out to the legislature, and, um, and we started asking, the, really, the legislature, 
the Department of Building and Grounds, and other policymakers to address the, the deficiencies that existed in that facility. Really, we wanted the women to be moved um, out of that facility, but it became really apparent that there, there wasn't a way to do that. Um, over the course of the past more than a decade, I think that we've we've worked together collaboratively with the Department of Corrections, with Building and Grounds, with the legislature to do all we possibly can to make that facility livable. When you hear providers saying, we ask the, the leadership of that facility and they say yes, that's no small thing. Because even something as simple as, you know, uh, a visitation setting or a private space has, it has huge implications for how the space gets uh, gets allocated across the facility. So um, I would want this community to know that we have felt like we've been in a real partnership with the state. And we all acknowledge that we've taken that facility just as far as it can possibly go. We are interrupting the potentials of the women who live there because we can't do the things that we want to see happen and what, what, that we know need to happen because the facility won't allow it. So, um, so that's where we are. That's um, that's and that's for at least the network. That's part of the energy that's driving this conversation for us. And I'm just gonna ask Mary Beth to add. Yeah, I mean, I think you said it so well, Karen. I think um, you know, back in 2012 when we all you know got together and wrote that white paper, um, you know, it was so clear to us back then. 12 years ago, and here we are. And um, my feeling is just that this next phase is really a chance to evolve our justice-involved system and really take it to the next level um, as far as rehabilitation, as far as making it gender, even more gender responsive and relational for the women. Um, I think someone said it, I think Jill, you said 98% of the women are going back to a local Vermont community. That's the reality. So how are we preparing them and hearing their aspirations and connecting them back to their local communities so that they have great success, they have the greatest chances of success. Um, and you know, the facility, I think DOC makes a really good case for this facility is literally sinking into the ground. They're literally spending millions of dollars a year trying to keep this facility just functional. And it's just, you know, as Karen said, said well, we, have we, we are at an end point, something. And it, it's interesting because um, even the women, when you talk to many of the women, I mean, they all have different perspectives, but many of them are like, they've been hearing about this new possibility and waiting for it and hoping for it. Um, they've been quoted in Vermont Digger saying, we want this opportunity. Um, when the women were up in St. Albans, I worked at Vermont Works for Women for a number of years. And when the women were up in St. Albans, they were building modular homes. They were literally building, learning all carpentry skills and all trades, building homes that were then sold and um, creating you know, a list of skills for themselves to then be that much more employable when they went out into the community. So there's tremendous potential. And I think the other thing I wanna hold up is just the amount of experience and the years of experience in this room. Like, uh, it, it really struck me as you spoke, Kylan, and each person spoke 10 years, seven years. You know, there's, there's tremendous experience in collaboration here. So my feeling is like, if this group can't collaboratively pull this off, no one can. <laughs> like, we are the people we've been waiting for. Um, so yeah, so I just, I, I, I appreciate, I, I guess I just want to say, like, I'm at a local Essex residence having you know, been a, an elected official, I know a lot of residents, and, and I'm also a journalist, so I'm also about holding diverse perspectives. You know, I believe this is a good decision for our community, but I also am really willing to listen to other people who have other perspectives and kind of connect them to the information. Really want to be a resource locally on this issue. I don't hold any formal position at this point, 
just a community representative who really wants to sit down and have a cup of coffee with somebody. If they really want to talk this through, understand, that's what I feel my role is in, in, at this point. So, okay. Can I say real quick, Jill, just because sure. Mary Beth brought it up. Um, the Mod Home program that Vermont Works for Women ran that Mary Beth was a part of, 100% of the women that went through that program have never been reincarcerated. Hmm. And one of them is actually an instructor for our Trailblazers construction training program today. She's a plumber. Yeah. And so it was a highly successful yeah. program. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a documentary about it, if anyone wants to see. What's it called? That Jill is in. It was the Bob Home yeah. Program. The, the, the little, it, was, it was called house. the Little House in the Big House. Little House in the Big House. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's great. great. It's Thank great. You. Little House in the Big House. And a lot of those modular homes went to single moms. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So we have um, 25 minutes right. left. We wanted to leave some time to open it up for questions from all of you. Um, again, you can sign up on the sheets back there to be informed of upcoming events and um, that sort of thing, but does anybody have a question to start us off? Um, I have a question for you. Um, are there lots of, are there other states that allow, like, visitation a mom and her baby, like, in a room together, and she's allowed to touch her child? Like, is that normal, or is that something that's very specific to our state, if you know the answer? I don't know the specific answer about how many states allow that type of contact, but I can tell you the parenting programs, such as Kids Apart, are extremely rare. Um, this is the only program of its type in New England. Um, we're, we're not, it's not, and with the thing that I always do try to, I heard your question, and the thing I always try to shift the focus to is that it's the support it's the Monday through Friday. It's all of the support. It's the case management. It's the hours that I spend sitting in my office with women, building those relationships that um, that Kelly talked about. Um, that is a, it's an extraordinarily unique program in that respect. No other in New England. Very few others um, across the country. New York has a program at Bedford Hills that Kids Apart was largely modeled on in its early days. I know there's programming in Hawaii and Oregon, um, but often when we've gone to national conferences, we hear other states talk about how they have parent ed classes. And you know, they're like really, that is what they consider really cutting edge. And we're like, well, we have, you know, we have this whole, wrap around level of services. Because I also, the other thing I didn't mention is that I have a coworker who's our community case manager. She works statewide with all of the caregivers. So when a mom becomes incarcerated and I start to work with her inside, my coworker is out there in the community checking in with that caregiver um, and making sure that that person has access to any resources that they need, that they have somebody to talk to. Um, that they understand the visitation process. That's all of those pieces that are really unique. Does anybody else in here know there are other states that do have wraparound care? I know that usually when people think of incarceration, it's not positive thoughts, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, are there other states that are doing things like this too? I know there's a lot of other no. states that do run like, social entrepreneurship programs with women who have been incarcerated, or there's a lot of national organizations that have gone in to do a lot of vocational training. I think the uniqueness that we see in Vermont, and I will not say that it doesn't exist, I don't know that in yeah. other places, but I do think the partnership among the contracted partners within the facility and in the community is fairly unique. Yeah. From what I've seen. I no, I was just going to say, I I know about at least for DBSB organizations that have a partnership where they kind of go in and out of the facility for having all of these services embedded in the building. And the way the physical space is laid out is that we're all in sort of this like programming hallway with the exception of Kids Apart who has like their own sort of like ensuite in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet in court. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we're all in 
this like programming hallway together so it's like you know i can send someone right over to kelly's office or right over to heather's office and it's like it's its own little like network within the building and i think that's what's really unique uh, i think a lot of other facilities have people come in and out and maybe share a space all together but we have designated um you know it's like its own little functioning town or city mm -hmm. my yeah. mom works at merrimack county yeah um, and the way that she works it's not like this. It's yeah, different. Yeah. It's very unique. So I just feel like another thing I can say is that the um, so I was formerly the director of women and family services for the Department of Corrections oh. for 15 years until 2015, and when so I don't know much about what's been going on at a national level yeah. since then. But at that time, there were fewer than 10 of us directors of women services that existed across the country, wow. and that it's. It's because of those positions, and the Department of Corrections mm -hmm. recently reconstituted um, that position at Kathy Aston Borsi's in that position now. It's because of that position that this was possible. And so, like, my assumption is that in one, I think of many of those positions are no longer existing. Yeah. Um, we have a forum coming up on Wednesday evening that's virtual that will have a woman who's in that position in the state of Maine who runs their facility and um, reentry program that'll be speaking, but it's because of that. And I, the other thing that I think is very unusual is is the way that the department has partnered with the community yeah. and brought community-based providers in. I think a lot of um, other jurisdictions, what ends up happening is that it's stuff that happens post-release in a reentry capacity, and this is really working with people from the moment. Right. I would also like to add that um, Vermont's really unique because we're such a small state that we have one correctional facility for women right. and like all the providers, we know the women individually. So we really have an opportunity to provide those wraparound services that really cater to that person and what right. they need, where I think other states don't, can't do that. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, the relational piece is huge. and. I might say, you know, I haven't, like Jill, haven't been in the facility like in recent years, but like all of the years prior, you know, this these relationships are hard won. There, there, we worked for the, you know, this over many years. I mean, in the early days with DOC, not to um, say anything negative, but it was it was hard. It was hard. We have a a woman superintendent now. She's amazing. She's responsive. You know, it, 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 these, this is hard won over time in really forging these deep relation, trusting relationships so that we can offer that to the women at large. Um, I, w I wanna do one more thing. I wanna open it up to like any residents or people. I wanna make sure that residents have time to make any comments, ask any questions, that kind of thing. Go ahead. I just wanted to add that part of, and it's not just like amongst the not just amongst the providers and the you know administrative side of the Department of Corrections, but the DIVAS program also provides training and services for um, corrections officers as well for trauma-informed care. And we're actually um, like kind of blending part of our trauma-informed care training with the Department of Corrections Safety Matters training to have really like aligned language. So corrections officers know how to utilize our services if they've ever needed them. Um, and that the women know that like we're providing training to the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections is providing training to us that really like helps us all, um, you know, work as like a unified system. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. I think for a, a, a lot of the time, the focus was on the women. And you know we've heard so much about the needs of the employees, of people yeah. mm -hmm. working in those facilities, mm -hmm. working in the conditions of CRCF, which is not an easy place to work and be day after day. So how I, I love that that that's kind of blending together and those services are being offered. And I would also add to that that um, the Community Justice Center has recently been involved in going into the women's facility and teaching not only women, but staff as well about restorative justice. And so there's a tremendous opportunity there to sort of bring trauma-informed practice, restorative practices, like great opportunity. Go ahead, Betsy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I saw it too. So the two questions I have are, um, what is the recidivism rate? And as well as how easy is, is it for you to find housing, because I remember back when I was out there, um, that that was a real issue. That you know, you could, they they are ready for release and maybe early release, 
but there's no place to go. Yeah. Does some, Kathy, do you want to talk about recidivism? It's high. Okay. okay. Do you guys know the number? I think uh, on average, statewide, it's about 41%. That's for men and women, right? Is that both men and women? Yeah. Yeah. And so where would you place the women? Because the women have this extraordinarily wonderful system that they can access and come out more more healed? No. (laughs) Something. I don't know the answer, but that's something that we could try and get more specific. Do you, Heather? Um, I just wanted to add, you know, when it comes to recidivism, it's, it's defined differently by a bunch of different people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, does recidivism mean that they picked up new charges and that's why it brought them back to incarceration? Or are they there because they violated conditions of release? So it's really hard to get an accurate, yeah. you know, data point because recidivism is really defined differently by differently, different people. Um, if there were a standard definition, it would be easier. And that's what I worry about when people like compare different states of the impact mm-hmm. that may not be defined in the same way. And, and a, a, a condition of the release might be maintain housing. Yeah. Right? Yes. So if you lost your housing, mm-hmm. uh, which isn't against the law, right? But it's right. a condition of release, then you might find yourself back in. That would be that would contribute to the recidivism mm-hmm. number. The, the, here we are, the providers, the Department of Corrections, the CJC, there's there's a whole other world out there of of systems that impact. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about sentencing, you think about uh, you know what the judges are doing, you think about what state's attorneys are doing, you think about you know the laws that are implemented that um, impact women differentially. The, those are all contributing factors. Mm-hmm. Plus the fact that that but that CRCF is also a detention center, mm-hmm. and so there's a significant number of the women who live there that are. They haven't even gone to trial yet. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's also, you know, that's, that's, that all, fa- it all factors in. And the department does support a number of transitional housing mm-hmm. programs mm-hmm. Um, around the state. So um, there are uh, many opportunities, but housing certainly is a challenge mm-hmm. everywhere in every community. Mm-hmm. It is one of the unique things with the partnership. Housing is a challenge whether you're coming out of incarceration or just need a home in Vermont right now. But mm-hmm. I would say one of the benefits and uniqueness of the partnership is how the providers work together pre-release to try to make those supports possible. Organizations, we give vouchers for hotel stays. We will make sure that you have a safe place to go. We will make sure that you have a cell phone or clothing that you need. That is very unique, that's not always sustainable, but it is something that we really focus on because housing is so integral to being successful upon reentry too. Mm-hmm. And do they also receive um, education around how to develop a resume, if, if that's appropriate, or how to present themselves to an employer mm-hmm. that will uh, create a better possibility of receiving that job? That's what happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I worked with a lot of women. We developed what are called strength-based resumes. Uh, regular resumes are chronological in order. And for women like us, it just highlights gaps in employment or high turnover. So we developed resumes that highlights our skills and strengths rather than the past jobs that we've had. Also, it gives us an opportunity to include those facility jobs so that way you know they do have recent employment activities that they can discuss during an interview um we also just revamped the windows to work program and the facility jobs are separated into entry-level jobs which are unit cleaners laundry and then advanced level jobs which either require more skill or more responsibility and for any advanced level position there's an interview process so that that way they get that practice and we do a lot of coaching what i'm hoping to do once um we get our computers connected is um i've had in mind of developing an employment portfolio that women can leave with that will have certifications that they've earned because community high school of vermont does probably a dozen sort of industry recognized credentials. Um, so certifications they've earned, letters of recommendation, the resume, so that when they go to the interviews, 
if you know they feel anxious or anything, they've got a portfolio they can pull out and talk about that during their interview. That's great. That's great. Can we say something about recidivism? I think um, you know, I think with the women, because we're, we're so we're not necessarily talking about. I mean, we may be with some folks, but for a lot of the women we work with, we're not talking about a crime and a sentence. We're talking about a cluster of really complicated circumstances. Um, and we really have to look at that, that look at them as a whole. Um, I met with a woman this week that was in the facility for the third or fourth time in the last um, three years. Again, she came back in on technical violations. The first time I met with her, um, there was something that needed to happen, uh, an appointment or something. She met with me, we took the, she attended the appointment, but she really barely engaged with me. I don't think we really had a conversation um, that first time. The second time she came in, <coughs> We talked a little bit more. We developed a little more um, a relationship, talking about what she needed when she left. She had some goals. She was hopeful. She was released out into the community. Um, this week, I met with her, and she shared with me that she has applied to um, to go to a long-term program where she ha will have the opportunity to be absolutely wrapped in support until she is ready to be on her feet. And again, we haven't really talked about substance use disorder and our coworkers in the facility that provide treatment for substance use disorder, but they're a huge part of this mm -hmm. um, puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she is so excited. And, you know, I just acknowledged her. I said, something's really different right now. Like you are volunteering to go to this program and you are so excited for those possibilities. And she said, I, it, it's different. She said, I can't do this again. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing wasn't working. And I'm going to change what I'm doing. And that's, that's where I am right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about recidivism for the women, mm -hmm. it's just, I want us to look at a much more multi-dimensional mm -hmm. view mm -hmm. rather than a simple yes. single crime committed, serve time, do not repeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you one more? Yeah, go ahead. That's it. Sure. Is, so um, this is about what our future might be with the, with the program. When you have women in the, in the jail, or prison, jail, retention, that, that, mm -hmm. how many are waiting to be adjudicated? And how many are actually there as residents within the facility that are women? Mm -hmm. The current population at Chittenden is um, around 150, and of that, probably um, like two thirds are there detained, waiting to be sentenced. Two thirds. Yeah. Two thirds. Sometimes it's a half, so, so it's wow. a large. Percentage. So when you look at the facility that we're hoping to have, um, are you making a difference in how those? spaces are for the people who are waiting to be adjudicated versus the people who are truly residents within the prison and are requiring your services not that the other women don't mm -hmm. but just that these women are the people who we've identified as receiving yes and i think the wonderful thing about what you've heard today and the services provided is that most of those are available to the women who are detained as well mm -hmm. um there are certain services more focused on reentry that are more appropriate for the sentence population because they have a set, um, they, like they know when they're gonna be released approximately and, and they need that kind of planning. But so much of the support and employment training and all those kinds of things are available to the detained women as well. I, I think there's also, um, I was speaking with Martin Lalonde, who's the head of the judiciary uh, in the house, and there's tremendous awareness around the courts and how they really have to, you know, get more people through the system quicker so that the, the, these people are not sitting in a, a facility, you know, so there, there's, yeah. I feel like 
like there's a more integrative thinking at the legislative level too around how all these systems impact each other and what are the some of the decisions that we can make that won't leave women in these facilities for all of this time for sure and and the other thing i want to say about your question i i for me personally i think that the 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 secure facility versus the reentry facility and what the proportion of that is that's a really important question to me and i personally feel that there's there should be more room for a balance there between the two right now some of the proposals that we've seen have been more secure beds than reentry beds i feel like the reentry piece is like the chance for us to evolve the system and really move it forward. So I, I'm going to be pushing and looking for more energy and space in the re and more money in the reentry piece mm -hmm. for sure. And I also think, I mean, I think data is really important to be considering at yeah. this point too. Yeah. And I don't know that the department captures this kind of data any longer, but they're not separate populations. I mean, another 98% figure, maybe it's 96, is that. Uh, cases are resolved by plea agreement, not by going to trial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those detained women become sentenced women. Very few of them, or at least when I was there, yeah. were released and didn't come back to serve a sentence. They just started their sentence from the time they committed their crime and were detained. Mm -hmm. So like, I would want to question any kind of like intentionally trying to separate them out as if they were different people because they're just at a different point in the process. But in the end, they're kind of all the same. I mean, there are security issues and things that the Department of Corrections need to consider, but they're a group that we like, yeah. I'll, I'll also just say, I think that everyone who works with yeah. women can attest that question. Yeah. I know. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. I know. Um, just didn't know. That reentry like starts the day that people are yeah. enter the facility. Yeah. Like the, yeah. as soon as we're meeting with people, they're planning for what's going to happen afterwards. If that's three days from now, if it's three years from now, um, so if it's like, how am I going to stay in contact with my family? How am I going to make sure that I have everything to leave this relationship? How am I going to make sure that I have a job when I leave? Um, and there are lots of people that do leave before they are sentenced or leave on pretrial release or are bailed out. Um, so the reentry services, like I think are so essential from the moment that people are entering the yeah. facility. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Lorraine. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I had a bunch of questions. I'm like, oh, I have two minutes. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, thank you, Mary Beth, for talking about that piece because I'm hoping there's flexibility in terms of how it's designed so that as a population, as we, the core backups that have been plaguing us since COVID and before COVID, it's been going on for not many years now, um, and we struggle with um, budgeting for expanding our courts, which is greatly needed, as well as um, the efficiencies of the IT that we're not addressing because we're not connecting across services so our ITs each have their own services and they're not collaborative which is a big problem for us we waste a lot of money in Vermont doing that kind of thing so I really appreciate that that's the thought is that we want to get rid of the backup because I think the the retention time the detention before they get their hearing is what's it on average it's really long mm -hmm. so we're traumatizing them further yeah. in this and i don't even think it's constitutional by the way because mm -hmm. someone has a right to a speedy trial it's not mm -hmm. happening we're breaking the constitution mm -hmm. as well and it's costing us a lot of money to do that um so we really appreciate that piece that we're thinking about how if we can actually make that happen that it would be mostly re-entry that was one of my biggest concerns about this is they think that the way we've shifted the population is not working as you guys know, for many, many years. Um, my other big concern was the people who work there. Yeah. Um, because they often feel in Vermont, we're on the precipice in the nation globally, as we see other models abroad that are working much better than our model, that we start to fold this in because we can look at what's working and what's not working, um, that some of the people that hold those um, positions are not well suited to work in the facility because they don't have the training and they don't have the education. Um, so we've been thinking uh, punitively as opposed to really restoratively, right? And to me, you guys can see through work. There's enough work now to know that restorative certainly is more impactful and effective. Um, the other piece, when I hear you guys all talk in terms of patterns rising to the top educationally, um, I know for men, illiteracy is a big piece of 
the pattern that we are <coughs> is the same true for women as well, do you know, in terms of illiteracy? And also when we talk about the educational, social emotional learning that we're trying to integrate into our educational systems, and they hear some of the training that you're doing, I could use that at work, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think all, all of us can use this. I also hope that in terms of uh, social emotional learning that we're also teaching about um, how social media impacts their life because it's a big, big problem, especially when people grow up in bubbles where they don't understand how to live in the world. And so hopefully that's a huge component as well in terms of what gets them in trouble and wasting time in their life. And so when you guys talk about these things and we're trying to prevent things and that I hear like DCF, some of them are repeated, is there a way to integrate those things into our, our public educational system so that we can impact those mm -hmm. kids that keep going in and out. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there is there is there public educational piece mm -hmm. legislatively also being tapped into this so that we can prevent them from going in the first place mm -hmm. or hopefully reduce, not prevent. I mean obviously yeah. not prevent. But... Yeah. You create vision. I'm sorry, there's so, so many good points. Oh my gosh. Gosh. Yeah. So many good points. And and I love how you're thinking holistically, you know, in this integrative way, because I think that's the only way to move forward and be, be successful. Right. So in, in my short, well, longer, shorter life, whatever, I'm 62, but, you know, patterns through my life, one of the key things I see, especially when you look at populations, women have always less populated incarceral systems, right? Mm -hmm. It's mostly male. The women, women talk more. Women are connected more. Yeah. And so really, to me, the core piece is connection. So when you, yeah. we looked at the Spoken Hub model as well, um, because when I listened to the doctors at Howard Center, in terms of uh, reducing usage, substance use, mm -hmm. because which is often core to trauma too, yeah. to me, that has to be incorporated as well, mm -hmm. is that this is a health problem. Mm -hmm. And we often, often do not look at that piece as a health mm -hmm. problem, because we don't, mental health is not, Every doctor's office should have a mental, like a psychiatrist mm -hmm. or psychologist, mm -hmm. just like the dentist should be part of, because you can have heart attacks from not going to the dentist. Mm -hmm. Those to me all needs to be integrated into our health system as mm -hmm. well. And hopefully in the incarceral system, the mental health services to get rid of that stigma that you know, the generation growing up understands this is the same as this, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. can, can I just say this? Sure. All of our community um, health centers have social they do. workers in there, people like that. Yeah. And Every private doctor, doctor should have it. I'm a doctor, I'm seeing you, yeah. and you're bringing this up. Yeah. I put a light on, and that means that other offices being aware that people are discharging, I want you to see that person. So th that's out there now. Yeah. It's probably not as pervasive as it needs to be, yeah. but it is out there now. Mm -hmm. I also, um, we failed to recognize some of our legislators here. I just wanted to um, recognize Leonora Dodge and Ray Garifano, our, our state reps from Essex, Senator Irene Renner, and we also have a candidate here for um, elective office too. Did I miss anyone else? But I think it's important, you know, that our legislators are here and listening too around what legislation and what laws, what things in the judiciary need tweaking and adjusting for all of this. So mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I uh, really appreciate that. Then I also want to recognize Betsy, whose sister Terry yes. Rao was a kick-ass superintendent <laughs> yes. at the facility when it was in Waterbury. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And is a former legislator. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> And we have Dawn as like board member as well. Oh, yeah. and Dawn. All right. Dawn is like board. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Dawn. What can we do okay. without Dawn? Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to add, uh, you know, since you did point out the legislative piece and also commented on, you know, the size of the reentry versus the secure beds. Yes. Um, I know that's one thing that DOC. Um, so. Jill mentioned earlier about stakeholders coordinating with DOC, and we've been meeting with them for over two years discussing the new facility. And um, DOC's really responded to a lot of feedback they've received in those meetings, and we brought that up. And so the legislative policy right now is detainees are classified as medium custody. 
Um, so if we want a bigger reentry, we need that legislation to mm. change mm -hmm. um, yeah. so that detainees could be assigned to that reentry mm -hmm. if it's appropriate. Good, excellent point. And I, I was just, I heard that yesterday in another forum. And so I really appreciate you underscoring that, Heather. That's for our legislators, that's an important piece. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to um, say that uh, when you mentioned like the two years, you know, the, of discussions, um, at that, just because there, this has come up and, and it, certainly when we've been canvassing, um, that there's this sort of attitude that that this is already a done deal, that this has been yeah. in the works, that Essex is already, you know, um, like it, that it's already going to happen. I uh, just wanted to. Yeah, to clarify that that isn't necessarily what's what you just stated, right? Because I know that some of us like to get a sense of like how much community participation is going to be uh, is going to be uh, facilitated for us to to all understand. And so this is this has been really really helpful. I think that um, you know as, as like I went to the to the facility to the correctional facility in Maine and visited men's section and the women's section, visited the visitation play space, um, you know, the architecture, like we, we learned so much about, about what an innovative um, and important change that can occur when you have the right building facility, when you just have like so much intentionality. And I think like that's the intentionality that you're naming, you know, that years of conversation. It's around like, what do we need, right? And so not to confuse that with, and we're going to do it in Essex, and no matter what people there say and whatnot. So. And again, we're going to have a, a forum on Wednesday that you can uh, register for to get the link. But Isaac, I didn't know if you wanted to speak yeah. to the de from the Department of Corrections perspective about not only the stakeholder group, but like, feedback from the community or what the department is thinking going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Isaac. I'm the policy director for the Department of Corrections. Um, I just really, again, appreciate everyone making space and, and time to be here today. Um, you know, to this point, this is very much not a done deal. Um, there have been years of discussions to get us to this point. Um, for you know, The department is working with BGS, um, and we've done a very thorough site selection process. Uh, we looked at um, 400 state-owned sites, narrowed that down to four, with it 25 privately-owned sites. Um, and from that four, we whittled it down to two. Um, one uh, by 2A Colchester Road area, and then another one um, out on River Road. But all that is to say, you know, as we go through the zoning process, Act 250 review, community input, discussion, that may change. We may have to go back to the drawing board. And I know that would be, I think, really frustrating for some folks who have put years in this process you know, for the women who are currently incarcerated who would like a different space. Uh, but we think it's really important to continue to have these conversations. So we'll have the forum on Wednesday. We'll, we'll uh, hear from the South Burlington folks um, who currently host CRCF. And um, I remember Jesse Baker, the city manager, saying, you know, she really wishes South Burlington could keep that facility because mm -hmm. um, they really value the partnership they have um, with the providers, with Department of Corrections, with BGS, having that uh, in their community and being a part of that movement. Um, but we'll also have the Planning Commission meeting coming up on the 24th uh, for public comment as well. And then I'm sure we'll have conversations for the next few years. Um, it's going to be you know, multiple years until we get a shovel on the ground. Um, so there's a, it's a very kind of multifaceted process, but this is just the beginning of, of engaging the town of Essex in that work. Isaac, and, can you also, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mary Beth, can you talk a little bit, since you brought up South Burlington and their municipality and their administration wanting to keep that, we've heard from um, several folks, why can't we fix that facility? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So just to clarify, what are the um, barriers to mm -hmm. that kind of notion and that idea? Yeah, I think, I think Karen you know, pointed to that as well. This mm -hmm. facility is more than 50 years old. Um, has well outlived its lifespan. Um, and, you know, it really, I think, in many ways, concretizes the ideology of the time it was built in the early 70s, period of just beginning of mass incarceration in the United States. It was a detention facility, not meant for long-term habitation. Um, and you walk through that space and you can really feel the way that people thought about criminal justice, you know, at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we're trying to do 
is I think turn the page for Vermont and create a space that really matches Vermonters' values. Um, I think it's very difficult to humanize someone in a space that's inherently dehumanizing. Uh, if you spend time in that facility, um, whether you're, you live there or you work there, you know, the slamming of the doors, the low ceilings, the difficulty that we have with the wetland that it's built on and um, flies coming out of the drains, and that, that's not a space where women can really heal and rehabilitate. And so I think Vermont is trying to embark on this next chapter. Um, how do we meet the women where they're at and give them the resources they need, need to heal and transform their lives, which clearly our providers in the community are already doing. Um, but we need to build a space that allows them to amplify that work. So are you in communication with these different groups so you know what they need for the new facility? Yeah, we meet pretty regularly. Um, and, you know, They're I think, also awesome. I just want yeah. to make sure that yeah, yeah, definitely. Into the, you know. yeah, well, that's, you know, we've been meeting for several years on that. I think we're still very much in the conceptual phase. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us as we start to design what the space might look like to think about, you know, how do we make these community providers the core of that building? Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, I think incarceration nationally for so long has been about severing ties to community as a form of punishment. And that's true even at its most basic policy level. For example, if you're incarcerated in the United States, by federal law, you're ineligible for Medicaid. Mm -hmm which has huge ramifications yeah, for right. how right. states in this country pay for the healthcare of people who are incarcerated. Right. It's the Medicaid inmate exclusion policy from uh, promulgated in the Social Security Act of 1965. Mm -hmm. So it's been that way for decades in the United States, but we're just now working with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and got approval from the Biden administration to roll back part of that federal law through a waiver process. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a little wonky, but what we're trying to do, I think, as a state is recognize the ways in which people are, are taken from community and how do we working with our community providers, including you know some of the folks who aren't here today, but Community College of Vermont, mm -hmm. um, which is coming into all the facilities to do free community college, our turning point partners who do peer recovery work, something we touched on briefly, but how do we bring them behind the walls of these facilities and make our correctional facilities look more like Vermont's communities, communities of which we're, we're very proud. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think, just part of the work that we're trying to do. Great. Thanks, Karen. I just want to make a note that um, it always it wasn't always like this yeah. in Vermont, and you know it wasn't always we were not always in a situation even as providers where we were in a deep partnership with the Department of Corrections. We've seen all the drawings. We've seen all. I mean, the Department of Building and Grounds has been at every one of our state stakeholder meetings and uh, and shown us everything. We've had input. We you know we were advocates. We know how to. <laughs> right. present a position <laughs> and I know the Department of Corrections has heard us present our position about this this configuration of, of re-entry beds versus secure beds the um, the thing that continues to give me hope because it's really easy to lose hope even from my chair is the con is the ongoing conversation that we have with the Department of Corrections I think the Department of Corrections actually is a really easy target it's really, they're like the evil empire over there. They're, you know, they're really easy to find fault with. But uh, I think going back to, from, from my experience, going back to uh, interim, super, or interim Commissioner Baker and now with Commissioner Demmel, uh, there has been a real change in the, the commitment to community involvement, the commitment to, um, to hearing us as stakeholders and honoring our role as stakeholders and to talking to legislators uh, from a more unified voice and a, a, unified, um, a unified vision for what we want to see. And so we're in this really interesting moment in Vermont where we have actually have the opportunity, thanks to this old dilapidated cranky building, <laughs> we have the opportunity to build the last, what, what we say at the network is the last women's prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't want to build, we, you know, I want to live in a state where we don't actually need a prison, but that's not the state we live in today. But I want to move toward that. If we build this prison right, this could be it. This could be the last prison we ever build. And I, I've been in my job for nearly 20 years. At no time during those 20 years, until this this last uh, five years or so, six years, have I had felt that I've had the, a voice in the decisions that the DOC is making. And have I trusted the decisions that the <laughs> frankly that the DOC is making? And when Commissioner Demo was appointed, I said this to many people, I kept, I kept waiting for the same old stuff, you know? 
Uh, he's never let me down. He's always been honest with me. He's always told me the hard truth. And the people that work under his leadership have also been honest and told, told I, mean, I don't know how the others yeah. feel, but I, yeah. I feel like uh, there's not much space between us. And, um, and when we don't agree, we can actually talk about it mm -hmm. and, and move through those disagreements. So I just, I mean, I have a really, I think I have a clear view about the limitations that exist in a prison setting. The limitations of the decisions that our legislators have to make about money. We're talking about a lot more money here. But I also feel like we will, this is a once in a, it's not even a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's, a, it's like a once in a thousand year opportunity mm -hmm. for us to completely rewrite this story mm -hmm. in our state. I also just want to echo too with that. I agree with everything Karen said. The department has also really allowed our programs to be what they are and not mm -hmm. fit into a box and allow them to be flexible to accommodate who's there and what are those needs. And that is a really, really high value. I also really want to recognize and Kylan brought this up with the network training staff. There's also been a huge integration of the department working within our community-based programs. We have a really large youth conference coming up next year and the department is gonna come table with that and be aware and make people aware of what they're doing and what they're trying to do. And I think that's a really, that's a really large step in the right direction. And I think it gives us a lot of hope in whatever the phase of the facility will look like that we can build programs that women need to make them successful in our communities. And so that is where I have a lot of hope in that. And thanks for including us in that part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah Heather, and then I think we'll wrap and let everyone go. Yeah, so go ahead. one thing I just wanted to end on is, you know, we've talked a lot about community. And one thing that I have noticed, so I've been working in facilities since 2017. and. The women and with the support of DOC and the administration at the facility have really developed a community. Um, Kathy mentioned the Restorative Justice Council. And so a lot of the kind of low level conflict really gets handled through the restorative process. Um, we've had a woman who ran the city marathon on a treadmill inside the facility. <laughs> Um, so there is a lot of community, community building that happens in facility and I have hopes that if we build this next facility right, there can be even more community integration. Mm -hmm. Great point. Great point to end on. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Jim. Uh, I don't really have anything. Okay. <laughs> Except that once again, we have another forum on, the, on Wednesday. Right. Uh, and you can sign up out there. We'll make sure to get you the link. And then the next planning commission meeting is the 24th, mm -hmm. you said? 24th. Yeah. At the high school. At the high school. Mm -hmm. the high school. They're, they're moved to a bigger space. Yeah. Um, and also Wednesday, just to say that the, the um, person who oversees the main reentry center, which a lot of, we're basing a lot of, um, a potential facility on is going to be um, online Wednesday to talk about like that experience, what it's been like, and all of that. So if you know that's, it's amazing to be able to get Maine has been so incredible. Yeah, and be making themselves available. So and I think I would just put out there that the Essex Community Justice Center can be a point of contact mm -hmm. to all of the movement that's happening, um, and we're in it for the long haul. And um, Pay attention to social media and front porch forum because that's you know predominantly the way that we get word the word out, other than the town websites and that sort of thing. And there will be more to come, but definitely we'll share any information, any questions, any thoughts you have upward and around the whole group. And thank you to all the providers for coming on a Saturday morning. <laughs> really.